In AD 60, Queen Boudicca led a violent revolt against the Roman invaders. The Romans were unable to defend themselves. They were preoccupied hundreds of miles away on the island of Anglesey, the last home of the Druids. These mysterious priests were the inheritors of a religion which had been at the centre of British lives for thousands of years. In one battle, the Romans killed them all. Why were the Romans more interested in suppressing this bunch of priests and defending their heartland? What secrets did this religion hold? And what threat could it possibly have posed to the mighty Romans? I'm an archaeologist, and I've spent the last 30 years studying our prehistoric past. This is a massively undervalued part of our nation's history. Contrary to the traditional view of ancient Britain as a land of barbaric savages, civilized by the Romans, I have discovered a country isolated from the rest of Europe which developed a hugely successful and uniquely British agriculture and industry. But the world of ancient Britain was about far more than technical achievement. People also had a rich spiritual life. These monuments are a mysterious part of our ancient past, which we have never fully understood. But we are directly descended from the people who built these strange places. And I believe understanding them will shed light on who we are today. It won't be easy. This was a religion without a Bible. Their priests valued memory over the written word. When the Romans killed off the Druids, they cut the only direct link we had to our ancient past. The British countryside is strewn with the remains of this ancient religion. It's just a question of knowing where to look. Throughout my archaeological career, I have found evidence that the people of ancient Britain believed in supernatural worlds. It was at Flag Fen in East Anglia, where I was directing excavations, that I first discovered traces of this other world. This is the place where I made the discovery. I was having a look at a Roman road which crossed a dike. So I took my people down here and we started examining the edge of the dike. Well, we barely started when I caught my foot on a large lump of cup wood which lay in the mud on the top of the dike. It had been sharpened with a narrow-bladed axe and it was made out of oak. Now, oaks simply won't grow in the wet fen, so I was very suspicious. I slid down the side of the dike and found more wood, which was about a metre below the bottom of the Roman road. Now, that told me that this new wood was about a thousand years earlier than the Roman road. This is what it was, one piece of an ancient trackway. These posts were driven into the ground nearly three and a half thousand years ago. But this is just a tiny fragment of the entire site. It extends in that direction for about 200 meters and in that direction for upwards of a kilometer. So it was a massive undertaking. Now, it has to be a causeway, but at certain key times of the year, it had a special role. We have found over 300 pieces of bronze metalwork here, swords, daggers, spears. 
Now, these weren't objects that were lost. They were carefully placed in the ground for a specific reason. This is a scale replica of what you'd have seen here at Flag Fen around 1300 BC. I'm standing on an artificial island that was made out of timber and brushwood. And running up to me across the watery fen is a causeway constructed from massive oak timbers. It was amongst these timbers that we found hundreds of valuable items that had been carefully and reverently placed in the water. Virtually unused prehistoric objects like these are found all over Britain. People have tried to explain by suggesting that objects were deliberately destroyed in order to keep their market value high. But I don't think so. These objects were being passed through the water or the earth into another world. Every time somebody decides to build a road or a housing estate, or in the case of C. Henge here, takes a stroll along the beach, something turns up. In 1998, Coastal erosion revealed something very strange indeed on a beach in Norfolk. The trunk of a huge oak tree emerged from the sea, surrounded by a circle of 55 wooden posts. The trunk had been deliberately placed upside down in the ground. Its circular shape was as important to the ancient Britons as the cross is to Christians. It was a symbol of a religion which had a very particular perception of life and the afterlife. Four thousand years ago, this monument stood on dry land. I think that the strange inverted tree trunk is being offered to another world which lies beneath the ground. I still find the memory of that huge upside-down tree strangely eerie and compelling. It was cut down in the spring, in the full flush of life, and it was transferring its life forces deep into the ground to an underworld. It was the prehistoric heaven. To Christians, heaven is up there in the sky. But in the past, it was down there. One of the things that the Romans couldn't believe when they arrived in Britain was how the native people seemed to have no fear of death. So brave were the warriors. Such bravery was armor no weapon could penetrate. Was it these strange beliefs which had helped the ancient Britons to conquer their fear of death? It's 5,000 years ago. Britain is in the last stages of the Stone Age. The population has grown rapidly, and the people have recently started farming their land. The Great Pyramids of Egypt have yet to be built. There is an explosion of wood, stone and earth structures across the British landscape. These circular monuments are unlike anything else found in the ancient world, and they have mystified archaeologists for decades. Intriguing new evidence has begun to reveal how these places might have been used. On South Uist, in the Western Isles of Scotland, archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson has just uncovered the remains of an ancient village where he's made some very macabre discoveries. It's basically a little community who were living in the sand about 1300 BC, 3000 years ago. It actually starts not as a settlement, but as a cemetery. They're living on top of a cremation ground. That's almost unheard of. 
I'm pretty certain it's deliberate because it's not simply that the house is built on top of the cemetery. Yeah. Its central half is right on top of one of the cremation burials. When that house went out of use, somebody came along and actually dug a little hole down and quarried into the side to get up underneath the cremation burial. They must have known it was there and they were either looking for something or trying to contact somebody in the beyond. Really quite strange. Mike has excavated three houses here. Interestingly, all three were circular. Right. And then uh, we have the northeast. But what's corner. extraordinary Over is here. that in the northeast so corner of each house, there was a strange burial human burial. Where we found a skeleton lying on its side in a crouched position. The big surprise was yeah. over there where we had a dead woman, a dead middle aged woman. woman, buried in a pit, holding two of her teeth, strangely enough. The association with death doesn't stop there. Just here, in the top of a post hole, yeah. there was a newborn baby right. pressed down on its face, looking out the doorway. And then, just to cap it all, this house outside has a cremation platform where they actually burnt the dead. Were these gruesome burials murders? Were they trophies, sacrifices? These bodies were a clue to understanding the meaning of this strange religion. In order to find out more, I traveled to another outpost of the British Isles, to Orkney. The Roman invaders never got as far north as Orkney. They'd been led to believe that this remote spot was occupied by primitive bog people. They were quite wrong. This rock is amazing stuff. It naturally splits into handy brick-sized lumps like this. Or you can have it in huge slabs to put on your roof. The wind here is so severe that trees simply can't thrive. So you have to build your entire buildings out of stone like this. And that's why ancient buildings and tombs in Orkney survive better than almost anywhere else in Europe. In the 1930s, Harsh storms uncovered the oldest stone houses in northwestern Europe. These two houses were built nearly 6,000 years ago. That's 13 centuries before the pyramids. There was a little corridor here to keep the wind out. Now, the walls were divided up by these slabs known as stalls. There's a hearth in the middle here. This was actually where the food was prepared. The end room here was probably a storage room with lots of cupboard space. Sort of fitted kitchen idea. Early houses were oblong in shape. But over time, the design becomes circular. Round houses, like these at Scarra Bray, would have existed all over Britain. But being built in wood, they vanished. Within the circular shape of these buildings, a formal pattern is clear. An elaborate dresser faces the entrance. There are beds on either side, and in the center, there's a hearth. This awesome stone circle is the Ring of Brodgar. It originally consisted of 60 stones arranged in a ring about 103 meters in diameter. So what lay behind the growing British obsession with circles and solar alignments? I think the simplest way to answer that question is to take things that structured lives 
then and now. Take a clock. Now, the hour hand of a clock mimics the daily action of the sun. And nowadays, we're obsessed with hours and minutes because work dominates our life. You could say that work is part of our fundamental cosmology. But in prehistory, societies were rather more fragmented. There were certain unifying themes. They were all farmers, and farmers I know are profoundly concerned with the passage of the seasons. I'm very much aware in Orkney that the weather must really have controlled their lives. They must have feared and respected the elements. And they believed that the ancestors could intercede on their behalf, not just with weather such as storms and floods, but other things, disease, birth, death, and even the harvest. So that magnificent stone clock isn't a timepiece at all. It's one piece of a vast panorama of sacred structure, a monumental jigsaw puzzle which needs to be pieced together to be understood. The key is that the monuments are interconnected. The Ring of Brodgar is the beginning of a huge sacred procession. A processional way travelled a mile across the narrow peninsula to meet a second stone circle, the Stones of Stennis. To the east lies the magnificent tomb of Mays Howe buried below a huge circular mound. The precision of Mays Hau is as impressive as any of the ancient monuments of Egypt. Its narrow entrance is aligned with the setting sun on the winter solstice, the darkest point of winter. Now, ah. look at that. Oh, magnificent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? Now, the sun would have come streaming down here when on... Midwinter mid sunset, that's the dying sun. Yeah. And yet it's at that very cold, dark time in yeah. this place, which is associated with death, that you suddenly have the light coming in. That's the time when we're moving into the season where things are going to start growing again. It's a sort of symbol of life, isn't yes, it? Yes, and of regeneration. Yeah. yeah. The cycle of the seasons meant something to the people of ancient Britain. Did they believe that human life too was cyclical? How did the living and the dead interrelate? Obviously with people coming in and out of the tombs, there was a lot of interaction between the living and the dead. And some people have taken this as far as to say, this is a house for the dead, and you have houses for the living. Some elements of the layout of the tomb are similar to the layout of the house. We have the passage. And if you can imagine I'm walking into either a house or a tomb, what do I see in front of me? Quite a large open area. Ahead of me, in a house, I would see a dresser. Here I see a chamber. On either side, I'd see a bed. And here, there's a chamber and a chamber. But the thing, of course, that's missing is the hearth, which yes. is the heart, it's the life. It's absent. And deliberately absent. The circular shape of all the structures in Orkney is no coincidence. These similarities are part of a pattern. Around May's Howe, Jane has discovered the remains of pits for standing stones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how many, I mean, how many others were there? Just the one? Well, it's possible that there was a ring of stones surrounding May's Howe or standing before May's Howe was actually built. 
So it makes you wonder just how much they were moving standing stones around the landscape. These four stones here are not actually performing any useful purpose, are they? I mean, they don't seem to go back no, into the wall. No, they're not tied into that masonry. They really are just standing stones, aren't they? But they're very striking. Yes, and they would have been freestanding and then the tomb built around them. Right. Extraordinary thought, isn't it? Just as a stone circle appears to predate May's Hull, Colin Richards believes a building or house may lie within the stones of Stennis. They actually picked up the stones and moved them over there. So this is the hearth that they found when they dug here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Square hearth, just like the houses, single entrance, same spatial organisation. But, I mean, I'm tempted to ask, if you've got a fucking great hearth like that, is there a house or big building actually within these stones. It's just possible that there is actually a structure underneath here. But if that's sensationally exciting, yeah. if you've got a building, what in effect you're doing then is you're sort of sort of monumentalizing a building, aren't you? A house. Yes, and it's the hearthstones which are always selected. Hearths were excavated out of houses yeah. and reused linking the earliest inhabitants with later inhabitants of the house. So it's sort of linking back to your ancestors. Yes. The tombs have actually grown out of stone circles, which themselves have been built around the remains of houses. What did all this mean? Let's begin to fit the jigsaw puzzle together. When individuals or families die, it's likely that their houses were left to disintegrate. The house leaves a scar on the ground, a memory of the people who once lived there. In time, descendants built memorials to their ancestors. Massive stones are quarried, transported and arranged in circles, recalling the roundhouses in which the dead had once lived. Still later, huge tombs replaced the stone circles, incorporating individual stones all on the exact spot that once housed the living. Tombs and stone circles did not just resemble houses. They were actually built on top of them. Unlike today, where we separate life and death, confining our dead to cemeteries, the ancient Britons wanted to be close to their ancestors, who were thought to protect the living. I think what's going on here is we've misconceived the stone circles. The way in which we conceive of these things is a remnant of old reasoning. If you shift the object of study to people's lives, people lived at Barn House. Mm. They go through a series of rites of passage mm. that involve these monuments mm. and maybe end up being buried or burying people in May's Howe. So, you know, if you start to think about people's lives and less about the material type of monument as archaeologists, you can see how they all operate together. I'd say at a push, you probably are dealing with the commemoration of perhaps individuals. Simply by dragging a stone in, moving it past other stones, you're almost reciting your kin by virtue of your movement around them. You're reciting a family history, a genealogy. I think that's absolutely fascinating. I think it really <laughs> does bring these stones to life. Immortalised in stone, the dead ancestors of Orkney are constantly visible on the landscape and in the homes. These people celebrated the presence of the dead and the lives of the living. Moving through these monuments was an act of memory and of respect. Understanding this mighty procession through the sacred landscape 
will help us to reconsider the most elusive of all ancient British monuments, Stonehenge. A huge advance in archaeology was made possible by the introduction of aerial photography after the First World War. Squadron leader Gilbert Insel, a pilot fascinated by archaeology, spotted something strange in a field just three kilometers from Stonehenge. It was December 1925. Excavations revealed 168 post holes. Mike Pitt showed me around. This is one of the bizarrest sites in British archaeology, I think. It is a fantastically important site, although it looks old. These concrete stumps represent six enormous circles of wooden posts, some of which stood over seven meters high. Known as Woodhenge, this structure has been a vital clue in unlocking the enigma of Stonehenge. This structure is contemporary with Stonehenge. Yeah. It's very similar in scale, and this concept of concentric rings is, of course, the same. Like Stonehenge, it's precisely aligned on the midsummer sunrise, so there's that very direct symbolic yeah. link with Stonehenge. But here, there were people holding ceremonies and feasting. It looks as if they were feasting and killing in very large numbers young pigs. So here, there are ceremonies involving large numbers of people. Whereas at Stonehenge, there are very few, by comparison, very few artifacts. And if you go out of the entrance, straight down the slope, you get to the River Avon, yes. which snakes away just out of sight over the ridge there. Yeah, yeah. And you can follow that river down south for a few hundred yards yeah. and then pick up the Avenue Earthwork, straight into Stonehenge. The journey is possible to trace in the landscape. Close to Woodhenge, the procession meets the River Avon, which snakes round and turns south. It meets the beginning of a ceremonial avenue leading to Stonehenge in the direction of the rising sun. This ceremonial avenue has almost been ploughed out by modern farming, but early aerial photographs reveal it clearly. It has to be one of the really dramatic entrances for any ancient site, I think. This extraordinary arrangement of stones, yeah. when it was built, for the people who saw this going up, was completely unique, nothing like it anywhere in the world. And then when you come through, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's astounding. The sense of enclosure and the different scale of the stones. These little blue stones sort of crowding round us like yes. people from the, from the past. These really were seen as ancestors. And that they've been brought over and then the sarsens put around them to protect them, to enclose them. Both in Orkney and at Stonehenge, the circles are deliberately lined up with the rising and the setting of the sun. These little blue stones come from the horizon over there to the west, which is where the sun sets. And the Timberhenge here, the big one, Woodhenge, is over there in the direction of the sunrise. You wonder if there is a connection between sunrise and sunset, between birth and death. And the stones are associated with death and the ancestors, and the wooden henge is associated with life. And so you have ceremonies at Woodhenge where a lot of people, a lot of noise, people who recently died are involved in ceremonies that are beginning to take them into the world of the ancestors. 
and they travel from Woodhenge across the landscape, down the river and up the avenue into the centre of the circle here where they join the stones with the ancestors and they enter the world of the ancestors. So this is like a, like a doorway yeah. from life into death. And then the procession, presumably, was a key part of that. This concept of, of procession and movement is written into the landscape with this long avenue earthwork. If this idea works, yeah. if there's some truth in it, then what happens is by the time the people actually reach the stone circle, they are no longer of this world. So we're not looking for physical remains. Indeed, no human remains have been found at the centre of Stonehenge. The passage from sunrise to sunset is the journey from birth to death. The transition from wood to stone represents the way in which our soft bodies eventually turn to hard white bone. Although the avenue that linked the living and the dead at Stonehenge has been almost erased, there is one still standing at Avebury which can give us a good idea of how the procession might have looked. Quite something after being at Stonehenge, isn't it? Where we know the avenue's there, but you walk along it and you can't see it. The thing that strikes me is the avenue is marked by these sucking great stones. The Stonehenge Avenue isn't, is it? Apparently not, although William Stukeley claimed at Stonehenge that he could see in the ground where stones like these had been removed from the avenue. And that's never been tested by excavation, so it's just possible there was something like this at Stonehenge. Somehow you feel that these stones are actually enclosing a space that is special, that is sacred in some way. Perhaps there were processions here, or perhaps these processional routes were actually enclosing spaces that were keeping people out. Yes, I can almost imagine this thing being lined by people. But Stonehenge and Avebury did not stand alone. Like churches today, stone circles were dotted all over the landscape. Archaeologists are currently looking for the remains of one right next to the Avebury Avenue. Mr Faulkner, a uh, mid-19th century antiquary, claimed when he was riding a horse in this area that he spotted the remains of a stone circle. There is one stone which remains standing. Now, Faulkner thought that he saw two further stones which were lying flat, mm -hmm. then a series of hollows that marked the positions of other stones which had been uh, removed or had been broken up and taken right. away. Yeah. These are the remains of a stone which have actually been uh, deliberately smashed up. It's in the right place, um, but of course two stones don't make a circle. <laughs> so we've got to look for more if yeah. we're really going to, to demonstrate that Mr Faulkner was right. These may be small family shrines, if you like, places where 20 or 30 people might congregate. Yeah. But you have centres like Avebury, which are the focus for, for really massive communal gatherings involving people coming in from well outside the region. Josh did find his circle, which is hardly surprising since in 2000 BC, Britain was covered with these monuments to the ancestors. This was the heyday of a religion which venerated the ancestors and celebrated the inevitable journey from life to death that we are all in the process of making. But why were the dead ancestors so important to these people? Why did they believe that they could walk the souls of the dead into the afterlife? What lay behind this macabre rehearsal for death? So why were the ancestors so important to these people that they were prepared to worship them as gods? To understand the origins of these beliefs, we have to go back to a time long, long before the construction of the Great Henges. Trying to understand a religion without knowing its origins is rather like attempting to explain the meaning of the Christian cross without knowing the story of the crucifixion. In search of origins, we must travel back 6,000 years to the time when the first religious monuments began to appear. This was also the time when people began a new agricultural way of life, and it's not a coincidence.
This is Knapp Hill. Near its summit is a causeway enclosure. They appear at the birth of Britain's prehistoric religion. These are circular ditches dug into the earth. A radical new idea about what they mean has come from archaeologist Richard Bradley. Fairly steep old bank, isn't it? Well, by Fenian standards. <laughs> So that's the ditch, is it? That's the ditch. Richard believes that these ditches represent a completely new relationship between humans and the land. Well, it's very dark green. Yeah, because the grass is taking advantage of the moisture. It's growing better at this time of year than the area around it. Runs for, what, about 10 metres, probably yeah. about 2 metres deep. Yeah. yeah. And the spoil they dig out from it is the bank we're standing on. Right. Probably 3,500 BC. You could make an argument, make a case, for these being the first ceremonial sites. Yes, I think they are. What do you think lay behind them? I mean, here we are, we're in a fantastic location, halfway to the sky. I mean, what, what, what do you think was going on? People are adopting a totally different way of life. Yes. Often seek security in an origin myth, yes. a belief about how things came to be. And I think we can understand the monuments in this country in terms of a real or imagined origin in distant places and in a different sort of world. So what caused this huge change? I think there's a very big change when people start using crops and animals. They have a different relation to the land from hunter-gatherers. Right. Uh, hunter-gatherers tend to take from nature to act in partnership with nature, in a sense to operate in harmony with nature. Mm. They don't impose and generally they don't own resources. Farmers own resources and have to plan for the future. This implies a particular conception of time. It involves the work of generation upon generation to be viable and that's very, very different. It's really, ultimately, about owning the land that you're farming. And in a way, you claim that your great-grandfather was there, and that is your claim to the land. This was the first time that the people of Britain had owned, organized, and controlled the land. There was a new desire to create boundaries between different holdings to determine who owned what. And when you share out the land, there is always neutral territory no man's land. It was in these special spaces that the causeway enclosures were built. Is that significant, yeah. the fact it's on the edge? Some of the things that happen at places like this yeah. are dangerous. They're where you deal with the dead, with strangers. They're places to set apart from the normal pattern of daily life. In this new farming landscape, the cult of the ancestors is born. Their influence was necessary for the continued fertility of the land. For the ancient Britons, the discovery of crops, something which when you cut it down can be regrown from the seeds of the dead, must have been a kind of magic. And it's possible that they believe that these ceremonial enclosures were fields for the dead a place where the ancestors' souls could, like the crops, grow to life again. These fields for the dead were everywhere in the landscape, and they remained special places for thousands of years. Maiden Castle in Dorset is a magnificent hill fort which started life as a causeway enclosure 6,000 years ago. OK, well, we're standing on this big lump here, yeah. which is an artificial bank, but yeah. this bank itself is built on top of a very much earlier one that was built about just after 4,000 BC. Yeah. And that monument is the earliest thing that we know on this hilltop. Probably things were going on here even before the first camp was built, hmm. before 4,000 BC. 
Like Knapp Hill, this was a special place in the landscape because it belonged to everyone and no one. In the Bronze Age, the westernmost rampart running up there probably incorporates a boundary ditch. These boundary ditches ran up to important mm. central meeting places. There must have been pressure on land. There needed to divide one community from another. Yeah. But then there was also need for these groups from time to time to come together to agree things, to yeah. have ceremonies and so on. What it looks like then is that these central places developed in neutral spots on the boundaries. I mean, presumably they were the safe places where people could meet. Yes, a, common, a, common, a common area. Keeping people apart, but people still have to come together for détente and a special activity went on within that defined area. This was a place where things happened, where communities met. Land had acquired a new meaning for the ancient Britons, and these patches of common land, packed with ancestral bones, became magical. What began as a celebration of a new relationship with the land became a way of life. The people who constructed the hill fort thousands of years later knew that they were building on a sacred place. But Maiden Castle has a sad epilogue. Its story was taken up by archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler. The most dramatic thing that I've ever been concerned with. He found what he believed were the remains of a vicious battle between the Romans and the ancient Britons. I've got a, a clear vision, almost, of what happened and how it happened. They came in in a rush. It's the only way they could do it. They got in amongst these chaps. They cut down the defenders, oh, in mass, mass formation, almost. One of these Britons was cut down with no less than seven cuts on his skull. It was a massacre. It was a place with litter with corpses in no time. We found 40 of them all with fatal wounds. It was very vivid, it was dramatic. Wheeler was a military man, as you know. This fantastic graphic description of the natives being beaten up by the, the Roman army. But um, only a certain number of the burials, only 14 of the burials, actually had evidence of injuries and wounds. I seem to remember from the, from the very recent excavations that some of the bodies there, the cuts, had actually healed over in the bones. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And clearly, you know, that takes quite some time. So it's not as Wheeler had perhaps portrayed it. It's no surprise Sir Mortimer Wheeler found so many bodies. We now know that Maiden Castle had been an important burial ground for thousands of years. Wheeler didn't acknowledge this because he was so captivated by the military success of the Romans. This is typical of the short-sighted view we British have of our own prehistory. Look at our buildings, our heroes, the way we work ourselves into the ground, the dark history of our imperialism, and we look like the sons and daughters of Rome. But we are not. Being invaded by the Romans had a terrible effect, not just on how we view our own history, but on how we developed as a nation. We've come to believe the Roman colonization of this country was a civilizing act, when in fact it was a brutal suppression. It's hardly surprising that we did the same thing to countries in Africa and Asia 2,000 years later. It's time to let go of our Roman inheritance and embrace our real heritage. At Maiden Castle, the only sign that the Romans were ever here is a rather insignificant temple which barely scratches the surface of this great monument. Our true ancestors are the people who built these vast imposing hill forts on land which had been sacred for thousands of years. The tombs and standing stones of Orkney the circles of Stonehenge and Avebury, and the hundreds of monuments which lie across our hills and fields today, are all part of a belief system 
which lies at the heart of our ancient heritage. These people were not afraid to die protecting their land because their bond with it was deep-rooted and strong. They believed that their souls would continue to own and nourish it long after their bodies had gone. Of course, the Romans tried to take all this away and replace it with their own civilization. But it depends what you mean by civilization. To me, it's just a word, dare I say it, rather like democracy today, which can be used as an excuse to impose foreign ideals on another country. Tacitus understood the situation well. Writing shortly after the conquest of Roman Britain, he penned some lines which still bring a lump to my throat. And so the population was gradually led into the demoralizing temptations of arcades, baths and sumptuous banquets. The unsuspecting Britons spoke of such novelties as civilization, when in fact they were a feature of their enslavement. 